Welcome back to Minute JavaScript, where I cover topics quickly and concisely. But first, today's video is brought to you by you and all my subscribers. So a special thanks to Deepak, Gareth, Abdi, Chirag, Francisco, Nick, Sarath, Nando, Cooled Flame, Fabian, Yantao, William, Sam, and Mox. I really do appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy schedule to watch my videos. And a special thanks to everybody who subscribes. It really is the support of you that keeps the channel going. So if you want to see more content like this, please like and subscribe. And now on to the show. So the project I have here uh, builds a custom gallery. And as you can see here in the terminal, uh, it takes about 90 seconds to build all of the images. And 90 seconds doesn't seem like a long time, but uh, it really feels like an eternity when it's running and I'd like to speed up this process. So I wanna implement node clustering um, to take advantage of my multi-core system. I have eight cores on this machine and I think I could process the files a little bit faster. So, so I'm gonna create a cluster to see how fast it speeds up this process. Now, one of the things I've noticed already by looking at this is that even though the real time is 90 seconds, it does take about three minutes, 42 seconds of user time. That leads me to believe that there is a little bit of parallel processing going on. And I think it has to do with uh, me running these uh, resize images here in parallel. And um, the reason why I think that is because the resize image library is using Sharp, which I believe is using some type of compiled binary, probably C or C++. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pull up the documentation for the uh, Node.js cluster page. Um, their documentation actually is pretty good. And this is an example I was looking for. So one of the good things about their documentation is they provide an example immediately. So I don't have to dig through each of the events to figure out how to do it. I can just immediately look at the first example. And this is exactly what I'm looking for. So the way on how to use this is you import cluster at the top. And so you create a fork for each of the CPUs that you have. Here's where they list the number of CPUs. There's a, a node package called OS that will tell you the number of CPUs. And here you can see that there's a Boolean here called isMaster. What you're gonna have is you're gonna have a master process and then you're gonna have sub processes. So the typical way to work in a node cluster is the, the master process will set up the other child processes. So there's no actual work going on in the master process. It's just used for setup. And you can see that's what's happening here. So the code here uh, just creates a fork for each of the CPUs. And then inside of the else, which is when you're not in master, it's going to create the actual workload. So this should be fairly easy to set up. So I'm just going to import cluster into my project. Import cluster from cluster. And what I'm going to do is down here in my main, I'm going to wrap this in a cluster dot is master. Actually, this part's going to go into the else. Uh, let's comment this out for now. Let's just see what it looks like when it's working. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say console log. I am master console log. I am worker. And I'm just going to run build images, which executes this file. And you can see here that it outputs just the I am master. It never output the I am worker. And that's because we didn't create any of the clusters yet. So if I were to just add this line in here, I should see I am master and one I am cluster. I mean worker. So there it is. I am master, I am worker. Okay, that's working pretty well. Let's look at my number of CPUs. I can add this here. Actually, let's just copy all of this. Just put this at the top, we can get rid of that. Now I should see one I am master and I'm gonna guess I should see eight CPUs. So if I open up my task manager and I go into the performance section, um, here I, I can see each of my different cores and this is what I'm trying to take advantage of is that I want uh, one process running on each of these cores. So I'm gonna run this one more time. Uh, it outputs I am master and it looks like I have the eight workers. So here's four and there's four below. One thing I've noticed when using cluster is that the workers don't automatically exit. So I've had to add a process.exit and I'm just gonna 
I'm going to add a exit code of zero, which should signify that it exited successfully. So I'm going to cancel this just by hitting control C. I'm going to run the process again, and now I'm expecting my workers to exit. So here's I am master, here's my workers, and I'm returned to my prompt, which is exactly what I was expecting. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add the, the process ID. So that I should be able to access this through just process.pid. And that's just so I can keep track of which worker is what. I'm going to go ahead and add this into the master as well. Just so we can see that um, they are separate processes that are all running. So I'm expecting each of these numbers to be unique. And I'm going to copy this because I'm going to go through uh, my console logs. So here I have a, uh, a console log that says saving to file. But what I'd like to do is actually include the process ID in here so that I know what process is actually saving the file. And the same with error here. I'm just going to go ahead and add the process ID in here. Um, let me see if I have any other consoles. And I kind of like adding it in the beginning. Um, so I'm just going to change these. And let's see what that looks like. OK. Now let's move this block of code up one and uncomment it. So I'm going to run main first. Actually, we're going to have to, oh, this is perfect. Process.exit is already in here. And I don't want to run this right now because it's going to execute this main function for each of the processes. So instead of splitting up the workload, it's actually going to run the entire workload eight times, once for each process. So what I need to do is figure out how to split up my array here, my files array, into multiple arrays so that each CPU gets its own separate workload. And I can do that by finding the ID of each worker. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say the worker number here. So I should be able to get this through cluster.worker.id. And that should give me a number of uh, 1 through 8. Oops. I actually started running it like I said I wasn't going to do. And here they are. And you can see the interesting thing is that the workers themselves actually do spin out of order. So there's no guarantee at which order your worker is going to start. You can see one and two are actually um, the last two workers to start. So now that I know how to get the cluster ID, what I'm going to do is split up the files for each cluster. So I'm going to say files and I'm going to filter them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a filter where I don't care about the item coming in. But what I do want is I want the index of that item. Because what I'm going to do with the index is I'm going to say if the index and I'm going to use the uh, remainder operator. And here I need to have my number of clusters. So I'm going to end up calling that forks. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my number of CPUs here on line 59. I'm just going to call that forks. And I'm going to move that up to the top because uh, I, I just want this to be globally available to um, not just uh, this block of code here, but code in the, this entire file. So I'm moving it up here, calling it forks. And I'm going to come back down to my forks. And I'm just going to say the index with the, the remainder of four. Hi, I'm Joel from the future, here to watch past me make a mistake. Right about here. And because the future can't change the past, all I can do is sit here and watch me make the mistake. But I can warn you not to do the same thing. In a moment, I'm about to compare this to zero, which is incorrect. What I should have been doing is comparing it to the cluster index, which would have been worker.cluster.id minus one. And I'm using minus one because the cluster indexed is one based. So I use minus one to bring it down to zero. Now I've corrected the GitHub repository as well as added the correct code in the comments. So now let's return to the past. And I'm just going to say the index with the, the remainder of forks equals zero. And what that's going to say is if it's equally divisible. So each cluster should now get its own set of files divisible by the, the number of forks. After that, I can just copy cluster files, replace it here. 
Uh, I'm gonna set a breakpoint just to make sure that this is working. And let's see how that goes. Okay, and if I hover over this, that's too many. So if I look here, I can see that files is 496 and then my cluster files is 62. So I'm gonna run build images again and I'm gonna see if this improves our speed a little bit. While this is going on, I guess I could bring up my CPU monitor and it looks like we're at 100% utilization and all eight cores seem to be pegged at 100%. So this is exactly what I was hoping would happen. Hopefully this process finishes a little bit faster. I don't know how much faster it's gonna be, but uh, we'll find out in a second. Okay, 48 seconds. So we were at about uh, 90 seconds before. So this is an improvement. This is about um, half of the speed. They'll go in from one core to eight cores. Expect it to be a little bit closer to eight times faster, but twice as fast is okay. I'm suspecting that's because there was already a little bit of multi-core processing um, because of the parallel processing going on here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change the forks to one, and I'm gonna run this with one fork just so that we can compare the time of the 47 seconds with how long it takes with one fork. And you can see it's running on one fork because the process ID is um, just pegged at 7,391. I should bring this up too. So I can see that my utilization is a little over 50%. Looks like we're hovering between 50 to 60%. And you can see each of the CPUs do a little bit of processing. So there is definitely some type of multi-core processing going on, but it's not utilizing all of the CPUs. So again, yeah, we're at 138. So it is about twice as fast. Uh, so I, I think maybe um, spreading this load out to the eight processors isn't very efficient. So I'm going to try and just increase this to two and see if I can get the CPU monitor to, to peg at 100%. That's that's kind of the goal here is the to use the minimum number of cores that, that maxes out the CPU. So it looks like I'm at about 95%, which is not what I'm looking for. I want 100. So let's change the forks again to um, from two to three and see what this does. 100% CPU. Okay, so this is good news. So I don't need to, I don't need to um, actually go up to the full eight. I think forking to uh, three processes is gonna work. I don't know if this will actually save any time, um, but I guess we'll find out at the end of this run. Fifty-two seconds. So it's about the same speed. It was forty-seven seconds before versus fifty-two seconds before. I'm gonna go ahead and chalk up those extra five seconds to variance. I think if I were to run this a couple of times and average out the numbers, I'd probably find that the difference between three cores and eight cores doesn't make that much of a difference. So I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this as three. Um, I'm gonna leave this comment in here uh, just in case I decide to go back to to more cores. So now to recap, all I had to do was import cluster at the top, set my number of forks that I wanted to create. Um, you can go ahead and create one fork per CPU. In my instance, um, three was fine on an eight core system. So uh, I went ahead and just hard coded that. You have to check to see if your cluster is master because you only wanna run cluster.fork uh, one time, just when the program first starts. So uh, master is gonna start, it's gonna run a fork for each of the forks that I have set. After that, once these processes run, each of the forks is gonna run inside of the else instead of, because it's not the master and it'll it'll fire up this main process so that's why it's always good to have your code bundled into some sort of main function i'd actually go a little bit further if this wasn't a personal project i'd, I'd move all of this code here in main out into a separate file and i'd have this entry point be just the the spinning up of the cluster and then i would import it um, but because this is just a, a pet project having all the code jammed into one file isn't bad and then of course in the file, you have to make your content cluster aware. Uh, another interesting thing is that um, by running by running this multi-core, it did save about 50% of the speed, 
but it wasn't an 8x improvement in speed. So while 50% is still a significant improvement, again, your, your miles might vary based on the type of project that you're trying to do this on. And that's all it really takes to set up clustering on Node.js. It's fairly simple. The docs are straightforward. If you want to check out the project that I've been working on, there's going to be a link in the description. And of course, if you've made it this far, like, subscribe, and share it with a friend and coworker. Every little bit helps me out, and I do appreciate it. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video.